and a great pleasure for the AA to welcome James Ackerman to the AA. He is Emeritus Professor of Fine Arts at Harvard and a former fellow and trustee of the American Academy of, in Rome. He graduated from NYU and is a former editor of the Art Bulletin, the first president of the University Film Society Center and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In England, he gave the Slade Lectures at Cambridge in 1969 to 70. I can only give really a brief resume uh, of his enormous scholarly and distinguished output. Many studies on Italian architecture, including the Cortile del Belvedere in 1954, co-author of 17th Century Science and the Arts in 1961, and a volume on historical practice and theory, art and archaeology in 1963. His book, Palladio, was published by Pelican, and his architecture of Michelangelo received the Charles Rufus Smalley Award and the Alice David Hitchcock Award of the Society of Architectural Historians. More recently, a collection of his essays, Distant Points, conveyed his broad areas of expertise dealing with theory and criticism of the Renaissance uh, culture and of Renaissance architecture. At about the same time, he published The Villa, The Form and Ideology of Country Houses, which built into his studies of Palladio, dealing with the typology of the villa from ancient times to the modern villas of Wright and Le Corbusier. It's a very great pleasure to welcome him here to lecture this evening at the AA on architecture and photography. I'd like you to welcome James Ackerman. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, you neglected to say that my main distinction is that I am an ex-client of Homer and Moulton uh, <laughs> and our house in uh, Cambridge, Mass. was remodeled by them. I got to talk about early architectural photography, which is uh, a subject uh, which I should give you a little background. You probably know most of it. Uh, it uh, was in photography as a technique was uh, announced to the public in 1839, and there were two quite different techniques that were brought out at that time, the originating in France and England. Uh, for producing a permanent positive image. Both involved the use of a homemade camera with a lens, that of Louis Jacques Mondet Daguerre, which captured the object on a silver plated metal ground, the daguerreotype, achieved a significantly greater precision of detail, but was limited to unique. Uh, instances, unique uh, positive images. That of William Henry Fox Talbot based on the production of a paper negative from which large numbers of positive prints could be made was more effective in providing multiple copies and thus uh, widespread access to visual information. In the early years of photography, when long exposures were required, architecture and landscape subjects were favored, partly because they didn't move, but also because they satisfied a growing interest among the bourgeoisie in the world beyond everyday experiences, manifested as well in an increase in travel, previously the prerogative of the very wealthy. Talbot capitalized on this feature of his work by publishing books 
of photographic prints. For example, sun pictures of Scotland, 1845, that appealed to the current culture of Romanticism and to the proponents of the medieval revival. Castles, ruined abbeys, ancient uh, country houses, and the undisturbed moors and downs celebrated by Wordsworth and Sir Walter Scott, whose Scottish castle, Abbotsford, appears in three of Talbot's prints in that uh, book. I came to an interest in uh, this subject through uh, working on the origins and development of architectural drawings, and particularly on, uh, from the point of view of conventions of drawing. It's a curious thing uh, that uh, the conventions of drawing, that is the plan, the elevation, the section, the transfer section, and uh, the perspective were uh, developed pretty thoroughly in the 13th century and no serious innovation came about after that time. And in spite of all the changes in architectural style from the 13th century to the 21st, the same basic ways of representing architecture <laughs> remain uh, through that time. And that puzzled me very much because you would think that uh, the techniques would change somewhat with the uh, times, but very little until the time of the computer and that altered the approach uh, substantially, but I won't get into that. Uh, now, uh, the uh, photographs of buildings also had a origin at a particular time, and that's a, a parallel which is interesting to follow. And they also remained relatively consistent throughout the history of documentary photography. And, uh, the, uh, my aim really is to discuss how the first photographers, equipped with a, a new means of re representation, decided how buildings ought to be depicted. They had to rely, of course, on the pre-existing representation of buildings by graphic means. Then, because the function of most early architectural photographs was to document buildings, I shall examine when and how a, a photograph may be identified as a document, and when and if such a photograph may also be a work of art. Finally, I shall consider what determined the photographer's or employer's decision to record certain buildings and not others at home and abroad, a search that leads to some thoughts about nationalism, imperialism, and colonialism. Uh, Talbot wrote in 1877, in the summer of 1835, I made in this way, that is with the use of a small uh, camera obscura and short focal length lenses, a great many representations of my house in the country, which is well suited to the purpose uh, from its ancient and remarkable architecture. And this building, I believe to be the first that was ever known to have drawn its own picture. Like many early photographers, Talbot, who was a mathematician and a physicist and chemist, who kept in close contact with the scientific community, was unaware of or unwilling to admit the extent to which photographic images cannot be defined simply as reflections of reality, but must depend on various elements of choice subject, position, framing, lighting, focus, and so on, that reflected and addressed the ideology and taste of its time. 
He must, however, have appreciated the degree to which the techniques of photography themselves impose certain expressive results. For example, the speed of exposure, the capacities of the lenses, the graininess resulting from the use of paper negatives, the tonal effects of colored objects, which are altered as they are transferred to the black and white gradations of photographic emulsion and so on. The photograph of 1835 that painted its own picture, as it were, hasn't survived, probably because it preceded the discovery of the essential fixing chemical. But in 1844, Talbot included several images of Laycock Abbey, his home, in a volume entitled The Pencil of Nature. Uh, pencil at that time meant paintbrush, basically. They're casual in their choice of viewpoint, as is this one here, and as is inf emphasized in the accompanying text, were intended less as a record of architectural subject than as an evocation of a romanticized medieval past. On the one hand, they're simply experiments with the medium and its material. And on the other, they are offered as evidence of the author's taste and status. There's a long history of houses being represented in art uh, in order to support the proprietary significance of the patron. The books and paintings had uh, nurtured interest in romantic and medieval subject matter uh, ever since the early years of the 19th century. Large-scale, uh, heavy engraved volumes with the texts uh, were published on um, medieval architecture and uh, had uh, extensive uh, historical and uh, descriptive uh, elements uh, alongside the illustrations. Uh, this is a, an example by uh, Augustus Charles Pugin, who is the father of the famous uh, medievalist Augustus Welby Pugin and he devoted his career to uh, making drawings for the cutting of engraved plates in such publications as this one, which was the Architectural Antiquities of London, published in London in 1827 and 28. Illustrations of this type established conventions of architectural representations that were adopted, no doubt, unconsciously by photographers. The position from which to shoot the facades and absidal ends of churches, the interiors, the choice of details, was very frequently based on what the engravers had done beforehand. And now the engraver could uh, remove uh, obstacles such as the building in the photograph on the right uh, with ease so that there is some difference between the two uh, simply because of the limitations of the photographer. In comparing two interiors, uh, the engraving from Henry Galley Knight's uh, An Architectural Tour in Normandy with some remarks on Norman architecture of 1841 on the left. I selected uh, Roger Fenton's photograph of Fountains Abbey for comparison because most churches with intact vaulting would have been too dark to photograph with the early lenses. So this uh, is a, a remarkably uh, similar image, although it's not of the same object, the one on the left being in France. The engravings were inevitably more interpretative than the early photographs. The techniques requiring incising fine lines onto metal plates 
could not convey the nuanced effects of light and shade available to the photographer. And the style and hand of the engraver usually exerted a greater influence on the way the object was interpreted than the disposition of the photographer. On the other hand, the camera had, and still has, limitations that did not affect the draftsman. For example, it frequently could not capture the whole of a large-scale church uh, facade with its towers as seen from ground level, or an interior with its faults without distortion due to the nature of the lens, especially in sites cramped by surrounding buildings and uh, where things were just too dark. When possible, the, photography saw, the photographer saw elevated positions on the upper floors of neighboring buildings. He could not, prior to the invention of artificial illumination, capture ornamental and structural detail in poorly lit places. In the end, uh, both techniques were profoundly affected uh, by convention and manner. They involved misrepresentation as well as re representation. The photographs prevailed over the engraving, however, because it could be produced and distributed more rapidly, and hence in great quantity, more cheaply, and by practitioners less arduously trained. I show you here a uh, paired images. Uh, this is interesting in comparison to the former uh, because here uh, there was a whole plain, an open plain before the Acropolis in Athens uh, so that uh, the photographer could put himself anywhere he wanted. But the fact that uh, the uh, photograph on the left of about 1860 by Dmitri Konstantin, a, a Athenian uh, photographer, turned out to have the same view with less foreground uh, than that of uh, Stuart and Rivette's Antiquities of Athens, which was done an entire century before in the 1760s. Uh, the fact that these are so similar uh, is uh, revealing as to the impact, uh, the recollection uh, that laid down by the uh, drawn and engraved image. Uh, now, I don't know that I could ever establish a relationship between these two because a Greek photographer in the mid-19th century was probably not an avid reader of Stuart and Rivette, uh, but these things do occur uh, by a, a extraordinary coincidence. Now, uh, one interesting thing about Stuart and Rivette is that these uh, pictorial uh, images are rare in their publications. Mostly, they did details of elevations in very strict measured uh, selections, uh, so that uh, these were kind of uh, mode of selling their uh, books, which were of interest to architects. Uh, to others interested in luxury uh, publication. Uh, the uh, similarity is not uh, only uh, to architectural convention. Both images that we see here have a debt to uh, classical landscape painting in the tradition in which a distant view is often framed on uh, one or both sides by a temple in the foreground. Indeed, the architectural photographer's models are found not only in the work of architects. The long tradition of elegiac landscape painting, incorporating architectural elements with roots in the mid-17th century in the work of artists such as Claude Lorrain, working in Italy, and Jacob von Reisdale in Holland, had stimulated uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century a taste for what theorists of architecture and landscape uh, design called picturesque. And landscape and topographic subject 
a large portion of which involved the representation of notable buildings, especially medieval ones, became a major genre of British painters, particularly watercolorists, in the early years of the 19th century. Oh, I forgot that uh, uh, I wanted to show another instance of this. This was uh, a uh, pensioner of the uh, Beaux-Arts, uh, the school of Beaux-Arts, a, a prize winner, I'm sorry, uh, who uh, came to Athens and found himself pretty much the same position as uh, the other uh, artists. Uh, early British photographers from Talbot on echoed the paintings of Turner and Constable, especially in their approach to ecclesiastical monuments. Uh, here we see this uh, comparison of a constable, which is very close to the one in the V&A, which I saw this morning. Uh, when Roger Fenton, the photographer on the left, uh, chose in doing the Cathedral of Ely to uh, favor foliage over architecture in such a way that one can find out very little about the building, he must have had in mind such paintings as Constables and Turners uh, rather than the interests of archivists or architectural historians. It's impossible for these reasons to distinguish clearly a documentary style of early architectural practice uh, from an interpretive one. Many photographers who worked on the medium in its first decade would have agreed with the statement by Fox Talbot that photographs made themselves, that is, that they are transparent records of what is in the world and that this is what gives them a special status among images. Indeed, the attempt uh, widespread after the mid-19th century to discuss and exhibit as works of art uh, those in which personal uh, taste or style is found would, I believe, have struck the early practitioners as an attempt to deny them the uniqueness of their enterprise. In effect, from the early photographer's point of view, photographs were, by virtue of the conditions um, of their making, all documentary. Uh, today, uh, photography is universally included in the roster of the fine arts, and it is the concept of a class of images defined as documentary that remains unresolved. I suggest that while some photographers, some photographs it may be used as documents, and while some photographers and those that commission their work may wish to produce documents, this intention does not suffice to differentiate their work from other photographic images. The documentary character is not intrinsic to the image. It is or is not in the eye of the beholder. In the early years of the medium, many photographers were engaged, particularly in France and England, to carry out programs documenting national monuments. In 1851, the French government launched the Mission Héliographique, assigning each of five specified regions to one of the pioneer photographers chosen by the Historic Monuments Commission, Edouard Baldou, Henri Le Sec, Hippolyte Bayard, uh, Mestral, and uh, Gustave Le Grey. This is an example of the production of photographs defined as documentary by the nature of a commission. Baldus was also employed in the 1860s to provide a survey of structures serving the national railway system. His image of a shed at the station at Toulon is characteristic in its simplicity and character, clarity and in the photographer's capacity to see in industrial architecture a striking new category of building comparable to the new category of image in which it was represented. 
Since the purpose of the documentation programs was to assemble archives of permanent relevance, the photographer was obliged to restrain as far as possible personal inclination and appeal to uh, the taste of his time. This is implied by the statement issued in 1857 on the founding of the Architectural Photographic Association in England on the model of the French Société Héliographique, initiated in 1851 for, quote, procuring and supplying to its members <coughs> photographs of architectural works of all countries with an eye to the benefiting of the architectural profession by obtaining absolutely correct representations of these works and to the public by diffusing a knowledge of the best examples of architecture and thereby promoting an increased interest and love of the art. A recent study has revealed one of the most intriguing instances of the ambiguity of the concept of documentation. It examines the commission awarded to the, by the French uh, Ministry of Public Instruction to a painter and amateur photographer, Auguste Salzmann, who was engaged in 1854 to produce a set of calotype photographs of the architectural monuments of Jerusalem intended to validate the hypothesis of his friend, the archaeologist de Soleil, uh, and uh, this uh, argument rested on evidence of chronology provided by the coexistence in certain sites of Jewish, Roman, and Christian masonry and construction. And these were to be the object of the photographer's attention. Salzman returned to France with 150 prints, which he gathered in the publication of 1856, accompanied by an explanatory text. It was his only uh, substantial production as a photographer. Beginning shortly after this work appeared, and with increasing fervor in the course of the 20th century, Salzman's photographs were discussed by critics as works of art, the quality of which was attributed to the author's exceptional sensitivity to form, texture, and composition. Yet to Salzman, the photographs were nothing more than evidence. He insisted that they were, quote, not narratives, but facts endowed with a conclusive brutality, close quote. Moreover, over a third of the plates were the work of his assistant, not only did Salzman fail to distinguish these from its own, his own, but subsequent connoisseurship, though fixed on the auteur interpretation, has failed to separate the two bodies of work. The expositions of the mid-19th century revealed uh, the ambivalence about whether photographers' to, uh, photographs were to be seen and exhibited as triumphs of technology or as a new category of the fine arts. Photographs were included in the great exhibition of the world's industry in the Crystal Palace in London uh, of 1851, the account of which by John Tallis uh, accounts of a vast number of um, sun-drawn pictures on various sorts of surfaces. He mentions the Talbot-type landscapes and the garotypes of the moon taken through a telescope by two different Boston exhibitors. The most extensive and admiring section of the review is the description of a medal-winning device for recording what he describes as the orrery and diurnal variations of the bar barometer thermometer or hygrometer. By casting a pencil of light onto a roll of sensitive paper on a moving cylinder, Tallis concludes with an account of the first experiments in color photography. The celebrated journalist and editor Horace Greeley wrote the equivalent commentary on the New York exhibit of art and industry 
also held in a crystal palace in the subsequent two years. His chapter, devoted to daguerreotypes, appears between those on artificial flowers and on hats. In addition to plates on allegorical and dramatic themes, he discusses images of the passions, the moon, Niagara Falls, and a panorama of Galena, Illinois. Uh, the French uh, photographic critic uh, Ernst Lacan published a book, Esquisse Photographique, in 1856, 103 pages of which are devoted to a review of photographs exhibited in the Exposition uh, Universelle in Paris in 1855 a celebration of scientific and technological progress modeled on the London Crystal Palace exhibition. The curators uh, included a vast array of photographs, the largest ever assembled, uh, arranged according to its subject, favoring themes such as plant and animal species, races of the world, types of mental and physical illness, uh, current events, military campaigns, and disasters. The section assigned to landscape and monuments prompted Lacan to speculate on photography's claim to be defined as a uh, fine art. While he concluded that it cannot be placé au rang des arts d'inspiration, he wrote of the photographer uh, that it is absolument nécessaire Il est le sentiment du beau, uh, c'est-à-dire qu'il soit artiste. The intention to produce objective images also would have been true of many of the photographers of monuments and frequented sites made commercially for mass distribution by entrepreneurs of the like of Louis Désiré Blancard et Brard who established in 1851-52 a printing and marketing uh, uh, establishment to produce books, albums, and individual prints that could be ordered from a catalog which tended to repress idiosyncratic uh, approaches in order to uh, attract a variety of buyers. Photographs you know, were used also to document the building history of important structures Baldus, for example, was employed to track the process of the new wing uh, of the Louvre in Paris and left thousands of prints, including a number of impressive panoramic images in the archives. The same occurred in the construction of a major Second Empire enterprise, the Paris Opera. Charles Marville was commissioned to record the huge demolition work carried out under Baron Haussmann in his urban renewal scheme for the city of Paris. Those charged with refurbishing uh, medieval buildings also recognized the value of photography as a support for the restoration and conservation of historic monuments. When Eugène Villers-le-Duc was appointed in 1847 to restore Notre Dame in Paris, he ordered large numbers of daguerreotypes to document the existing state of the building because of the exceptional capacity of the process to record fine detail. For his purposes, the fact that the images could not be reproduced in multiples was no drawback. The best known monuments were, of course, uh, many photographs uh, knowingly are not exploited, uh, the uh, aesthetic potential of the, uh, of the medium in portrait architecture expressively, uh, in contrast to the six relatively uh, straight uh, record of the church, the Madeleine in Paris on the left, Bayard's image of the aisle behind the facade. Uh, the graininess is due to the author's use of the calotype in which he had been an unrecognized uh, pioneer, having in invented a process for producing direct positive prints. Uh, that would not have recalled the impression of most 
visitors to the building, this one on the right. It is the record of a personal response, and this subject is as much the play of light and shadow as it is the church. This does not imply that Le Sec or Talbot, uh, who did another photograph of the same building, produced a definitive record of the church. Uh, like a majority of architectural photographers of his time, uh, they chose an elevated uh, viewpoint uh, that would not have been available to the casual visitor so as to avoid parallax. I do not believe, as has been suggested, that this typical decision was influenced by the orthogonal uh, elevation that was standard in architectural drawing. The documentary and the expressive photograph, however, were not necessarily the work of different photographers. Charles Negre claimed that when visiting an architectural site, he would take three kinds of photographs. For the architect, a general view with the aspect and precision of a geometric elevation. <coughs> For the sculptor, close-up views of the most interesting details. And for the painter, a picturesque view, capturing the imposing effect and poetic charm of the monument. Photography was closely linked to the strengthening of European nationalism in the first half of the 19th century. The program launched to document uh, particular aspects of each country's architecture underscored the nationalistic tendencies <coughs> uh, of the time. Subjects were chosen, uh, perhaps uh, subliminally, to reinforce a particular concept of the significance of certain periods in the past. In France and England, later medieval architecture was emphasized. British photographers did not show much interest in Anglo-Saxon buildings, although those would best have represented an indigenous uh, in achievement emphasizing architectural uh, independence from France. If anyone in the audience uh, has an idea of why Anglo-Saxon was out at that moment, I would be glad to hear of it. Uh, this might uh, be explained by the emphasis placed on late medieval uh, sources uh, by the contemporary promoters of the Gothic Revival. Uh, Renaissance, Baroque, and contemporary architecture attracted less attention in Britain and France, except for major public enterprises in the capital cities. Uh, though in Italy, the Renaissance style, regarded as one of the major cultural achievements of the peninsula, accounted for a major proportion of the output. Italian photographers focused on urban architecture in major centers, Few of the tourists who bought their prints ventured into the countryside looking for abbeys and villas. Tourism, in fact, was a guiding force in the increasing uh, demand for architectural photographs. The huge production of images, particularly of Greece and the Middle East in the mid-19th century, was in part the result of a great growth in, in the culture and industry of tourism. During the 18th century, most travelers, especially in Great Britain, were persons of rank and wealth who frequently embarked on the Bandayar, a year spent primarily uh, by young noblemen, moving about in uh, the more familiar parts of the world to absorb foreign cultures and languages. Travel for pleasure and knowledge required both the economic and the cultural disposition to move beyond the borders of one's homeland. It originated as an anticipation of 19th century imperialism and colonialism, an initial uh, possession of other places and people. In the early years of the 19th century, the growth in, in, of industry and commerce attendant on the Industrial Revolution gave an expanding bourgeoisie a means of emulating on a more modest scale the predilections of the aristocracy. <coughs>
if not in the mold of the Bondi Yard, at least in vacation excursions. And Thomas Cook and company was an important force uh, in Britain for this development. Photographic studies of non-European lands like those of national monuments were anticipated in printed publications of the early years of the century from the time of Napoleon's conquest of Egypt, which is reported in a multi-volume uh, work of 1809-22. The favored sites were Egypt with a focus on ancient monuments and the Middle East with an emphasis on places in the Holy Land known from the Bible. Greece, principally Athens, and Rome, principally the city, were represented by a lesser volume of prints. <coughs> and Turkey, despite its treasures of Byzantine monuments, was barely noticed. The photographers followed the trail of colonial conquest and the fashions of newly developed bourgeois travel and saw their subjects in the light of Orientalism as strange and exotic echoes of a far distant past, now in the control of a decadent and indolent people. Many photographs of native costumes and customs were produced alongside those architecture. Uh, Maxime de Camp, who's, uh, who traveled with Flaubert uh, to Egypt, uh, produced a large number of photographs uh, he had a Muslim uh, sailor on his boat that he uh, forced into service as a model to give scale to the pictures and dressed him in proper oriental costume. Uh, he told uh, this uh, young man uh, that the camera uh, would fire explosives uh, if he moved. Uh, and for long uh, exposures, uh, this uh, fellow seemed to have stayed still. <laughs> Where human beings appear in the photograph, they almost invariably appear to be laborers or ne'er-do-wells or nomads, far removed from the self-presentation of enterprising Western Europeans. Uh, we see here uh, a, uh, a print on the right from the studio of uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the producer. At any rate, it, uh, it was one of the late uh, 19th century uh, firms, Bonfils, uh, that produced the volumes of illustrations of uh, Near Eastern monuments, and here it's really as much a portrait of the indolence of the young man as it is of any building. It's the same kind of uh, approach as you get in uh, early 19th century painting in France with the rich Orientalism of Delacroix, in this case of Angre. Uh, where uh, the uh, languor of the East uh, is the principal theme. It's interesting that the reclining figure in both the pictures uh, is similar. Uh, two relevant functions of the architectural photograph are it's used by the architect as a resource in designing new buildings, employing reference to historical style, and by the historian of architecture. For the architectural designer, photographs can provide a rich resource and stimulus. The fact <coughs> that photography became available at the height of the medieval revival and of the taste for the picturesque made this especially evident. In contrast, architects working in the classical revival style, which continued to be practiced alongside the medieval revival, 
found measured plan sections and elevations in the tradition of Stuart and Rivette and Charles Louis Clérisseau's Antiquité de la France uh, of 1778. They found these more useful than photographs because the strict rules of classical comp composition and proportions could be conveyed more effectively in precisely measured architectural renderings. Publications addressed to the growing interest in the medieval um, revival and picturesque architecture emphasized pictorial effects of massing, contrast of light and shadow, texture and color, richness of ornament, all of which could be captured more effectively by the camera than by the draftsman and engraver. Uh, but potentialities for early architectural photography had already been suggested during the first three decades of the 19th century by new techniques of printing, the lithographs, the aquatint, and the mezzotint, which were employed increasingly to convey these aspects of architecture and were the principal vehicles for the diffusion of the picturesque. Most of the villa and landscape publications employed these techniques. For example, the Papworth Rural Residences of 1813. <coughs> Photographs provided a resource that not only expanded the designer's knowledge of familiar historical traditions, but extended the scope of his knowledge to a wide spectrum of historical styles less accessible at first hand, especially those of the Egypt, uh, Byzantium, and the Middle East. In France, the influential Second Empire style, promoted by the École de Beaux-Arts, employed a rich uh, amalgam of ancient Renaissance, Baroque, and Rococo elements and ornamental motifs that made photographic archives a virtual necessity for the practitioners. In the second half of the 19th century, architects increasingly became the patrons of photographers, as it became evident that photographic portfolios could serve as a way of spreading awareness of their works and attracting clients. Shortly after the journal American Architect began to illustrate buildings with photographs in 1876, the architect Henry Hobson Richardson began to sponsor photographic campaigns surveying his major buildings. He was the first designer to be published in the monographs of American architecture started in 1886. Two years later, uh, Mrs. Schuyler uh, Van Rensselaer published Henry Hobson Richardson and His Works, the first study of an architect illustrated with large-scale photographs, of which you see one here, and at the same time the first scholarly historical critical study of a contemporary architect. Uh, given the nature of this specialty of the 19th century, it's quite extraordinary that this pioneer was a woman. Uh, this is a picture of Trinity Church in Boston uh, as it originally was built. It was subsequently altered by the addition of a projecting porch and other details. Uh, the photographs of the buildings of Richardson and his contemporaries lacked the vividness and imagination of architectural images prior to mid-century. The excitement of the new techniques had worn off, and almost all the painters and engaged amateurs of the first decade had gone on to other interests, in, in leading the field to commercial establishments devoted to recording buildings on the demand of architectural firms and trade publications. Moreover, while propagandists had insisted on establishing photography as a fine art, it never was more than a complex of techniques, uh, though one which a few practitioners could utilize for artistic purposes. The camera by itself, with the aid of somebody to place it and open its shutter, uh, 
could record buildings, people, or scientific data effectively without expressive enrichment. Granted, a painter or a sculptor could employ the tools of the artist without achieving expressive enrichment, but the result is just bad art and nothing else. While a commercial photographer employs the available technology to produce a useful record uh, that need not be more than that. The photographic archive of Richardson himself, an impassioned uh, collector, largely of medieval French architecture, there's 3,000 prints which I've gone through in Cambridge, uh, was employed to stimulate and to give authenticity to his characteristic Romanesque revival style. The majority of prints were commissioned from local photographers, most of whom probably made a living uh, from portraits and weddings. They are dull, but they served him well. Toward the end of the century, innovative photographers, Frederick Evans, Edward Steichen, Alfred Stieglitz, Eugene Atjeh, turned away from a documentary approach and employed architectural subjects in the expression of a distinct personal style. For modernist architects, beginning in the second decade of the 20th century, images of historical architecture were of less concern, but powerful photographs of contemporary work, particularly buildings by the most uh, eminent architects, uh, notably those of Bauhaus at Dessau, perhaps by Moholy Nash, affected the spread of the style. Modern history of architecture had its origins in Western Europe at about the time when photographers, photographs of buildings became available to scholars. Photographs did not create the discipline, but without them, opportunities for the development of sophisticated research methods would not have been available to them, who previously had had access only to drawings and traditional prints. A method grounded on systems of classification could be developed without the capacity uh, uh, to make comparison between buildings and groups of buildings, but photographs are fundamental to the practice of historical research and interpretation because they give a scholar an almost infinitely expandable collection of visual records of buildings and details of buildings in his or her area of research. With the development after the mid-19th century of fine, long focus lenses and increasingly sensitive uh, negatives permitting rapid exposure, many aspects of buildings, whether due to their distance uh, from the ground or the obscurity of detail and dark interiors, could be revealed in photographic uh, and, uh, images that were not accessible to the naked eye. At the same time, the lack of scale and color the distortions due to the machine and the domination of conventions of representation make misrepresentation inevitable. Photographs can never become a substitute for first-hand experience. Uh, and I want to speak of a individual first-hand experience that I had recently. I went to visit uh, at an abbey in Tuscany called Sardam Timo. Uh, this abbey church is built in alabaster. And alabaster is the most luscious and extraordinary material for construction that you can possibly imagine. And no photograph could distinguish between this material and travertine or whatever. Uh, it just wouldn't come through because it's a certain way of absorption of light. Uh, so you have to go there, uh, not just the place I went, but to wherever there is uh, to really understand a building. 
It's difficult to uh, define precisely the motivations underlying the photographer's choice of architectural subject because we cannot be sure what portion of the photographic work of the period has been preserved. Moreover, we who are non-specialists know of early photography primarily through publication, which has emphasized the achievements of only a few countries, and two of them, England and France, to a disproportionate degree. But accepting these limitations, we can still see in the early history of architectural photography two basic principles. First, that modes of representation are not significantly altered when new techniques are discovered, uh, but perpetuate pre-existing conventions. And secondly, that representation itself is not a reflection of some reality in the world about us, but is a means of casting onto that world a concept or subliminal sense of what reality is. Thank you. that there was the equivalent in England. Uh, Roger Fenton was sent to the Crimea to do the uh, uh, Crimean War. Uh, there's actually uh, photographs of the Tennyson poem. <laughs> uh, and, uh, war pictures were a category in the ex expositions that I uh, spoke of. Uh, at Certainly, the importance of this is that it's news. And the other things that, the other categories of photography uh, were informative, they were scientific, they were documentary, but they weren't news. And uh, that makes your question extremely relevant. Uh, I'll have to add it to this. You may. Well, obviously, kind of photography arrives at a point kind of in the 19th century which makes everyone kind of praise it in terms of providing a possible record for those buildings which still may kind of vanish through destruction. Um, and one kind of knows that, that that's the relation for kind of Ruskin uh, and, say, for the other Duke. Yeah. Um, but to what extent did they also think? Uh, that photography already kind of intervened to represent certain aspects of architecture kind of rather than others. I, I don't recall any record of things that were said uh, to that effect, but it's interesting that Ruskin was a great enthusiast uh, for daguerreotypes uh, in his first uh, visits to Venice and many Ruskin watercolors of Venetian subjects are based on daguerreotypes which his assistant or butler uh, took during his visit. And then years later, he became an avid opponent of photography and attacked it as destructive to art and our visual acuity. Uh, but there are a lot of other possibilities in that question uh, uh, of, of interest, certainly the, uh, the, the fact that pho photographs are, show uh, what they're best able to show, uh, 
also leads those of us who use them into limiting our own vision to what we can see in the photograph and the example of the Abbey of San Antimo is an instance of that, uh, but there are many other ways in which we can be limited by the limitations of our technique. And I find our art historians and architecture historians are extremely insensitive to the falsity that it, there, are, there is in, in the art, uh, photographic print. Well, thank you for your attention. Oh, Bruce. I thought of an analogy with uh, Werflin because in the 1890s, uh, Heinrich Werflin wrote a series of articles about how to photograph sculpture. Yeah. And his great preoccupation was that you had to take the viewpoint, which was the intended viewpoint of the sculptor, and that if you didn't, you would get the wrong viewpoint and you would risk misinterpreting yeah. the um, work of art. And this is really the beginning of this whole idea of the principal viewpoint of, say, a Bernini or something right. like that, which is conditioned by photographs. And m as you said, most of the photographers originated as um, engravers or yeah. landscape painters, things like that. So they already had a kind of picturesque approach to these things. Right. But there's a kind of insidious uh, circular reasoning yeah. that underlines a lot of the early assumptions about the use of photography in art history. You're quite right, people did not normally take a position that uh, where the artist intended. I, I was just uh, noticing when I visited uh, yesterday the uh, uh, Parthenon room in the British Museum. Uh, the, the pediment sculptures are, are all done uh, to be seen uh, in a way, we, we really have to not only kneel, but, but grovel on the ground to see them from the right perspective. And the proportions of the figures are adjusted to the way you see them from the ground. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, photographs always give it to you straight on. Say, would be true of the Moses of Michelangelo, which was meant to be about six feet in the air, no more than that probably. Uh, in that case, I have seen photographs taken from the, uh, from the intended position because as, uh, one of our colleagues uh, decided that uh, it would be very revealing to re-photograph the statue from that point. Yes, I think I mentioned that at the start, buildings and landscapes were a very favored genre. Uh, but it's interesting that Fox Talbot, who is the inventor, one of the two inventors of photography, did put people into his photographs of Laycock Abbey. Uh, and they were for the most part, servants. Uh, and they may have been told by Talbot, as well as Ducamp, to stay still or else they'd be shot. Uh, and uh, the idea is primarily to give scale. Uh, I'd have to add, uh, as a footnote to that, I, uh, I in, the, in the 70s, I made some uh, films of architecture, one on Palladio particularly, and 
uh, for the cinematographer, the photographing of architecture is uh, difficult from exactly the opposite uh, point of view, that nothing moves and you don't want a film to be immobile. Uh, so we got into hiring helicopters and uh, to ha uh, photograph buildings when people were moving in and out. In the case of Palladio Villas, that was kind of difficult because uh, you couldn't simply wait for somebody to come along because it happened every two days. Uh, but uh, I think it's amazing the number of helicopters that uh, were involved in, in architectural photography, uh, cinematography, for that very reason. Uh, and it is fairly effective, except it doesn't show you the object the way you usually see it. it, was, it it's great pleasure, I must say, to look at buildings this way because you get a very different idea of the environment. It's a good idea. I, I, I would like to uh, not just answer that off the cuff. Uh, I have a feeling that the, the, the conventionality of architectural uh, drawing uh, overrode uh, the the new vision. For example, in, in France, uh, any uh, official building had to be drawn up in a way that was so weighted down by bureaucratic detail, uh, every, uh, every element in French drawing of the 19th century for public purposes uh, had to be defined, and there were hundreds and hundreds of drawings required that were, must have absorbed much more uh, invention and uh, much more time and effort than any creative activity. Uh, it practically smothered creative activity, the degree to which the process uh, was limited. That doesn't answer your question, I know, but I, I would like to give more thought to that. Good and idea. Way, I mean, you started with the description of the building kind of drawing itself. Um, frequently when we do see people presenting their work here, you could say it's a photograph building itself. very much you Thank you. Thank you.